Well, look who I can see over here cleaning the church. Joy, it's nice to see you. Hello. How have you been keeping? Well, not so bad, you know. It's been a bit of a struggle, unfortunately. I've just gone back to work, which I didn't really want to go back, but finances must agree. You've got to go back. Yeah, we've but, got to win. Um, yeah, I'm getting fine. Been a bit down. Been making loads and loads of different things. Made loads of cushions. I'm in the middle of doing a quilt. Oh yeah, keeping busy, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm keeping busy. And you're making face masks. <laughs> oh yes, but, yeah, very, very nice, yeah. Yes, I like to sort of get a few made for people. Very trendy, yeah. Anybody you want to say hello to, Joy? Yes, I'd like to say to all the church people, I miss coming to church on a Sunday morning. And, um, I'm looking forward to coming back to the choir again because I miss that on a Sunday. Yes, Saturday the choir, Sunday. yeah. Brilliant. And I do miss that an awful lot. Yeah. Fantastic, Joy. Give us a wave. Bye. Well, I've tracked them down. I've got here Malena, I've got Ben, I've got Daniel and Emmanuel. Hello, guys. Hi, Hi. everyone. Hi. Really nice to see you. How have you been in lockdown? Good. <laughs> it hasn't been too boring? No, it was already busy, was it? What were we doing? Ah, uh, Well, luckily we didn't forget. <laughs> Mommy, what have we been doing? Um, swimming in the pool, playing on the trampoline, and Thank doing you. homework. And a lot of housework. Yes. <laughs> a lot of housework, yeah. Have you helped with that, Ben, Dan? Uh, yes. Yeah. What did you do? <laughs> uh, play in the pool, play, done homework. That's good. Have you, has there been any chance of schoolwork as well, or has that have you been had a really big? Work. Yeah, you've you've kept your brains ticking over, have you? Hi. And did I hear about a trip to Legoland recently? Yeah. 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 Okay. W was that good for you? Yeah. 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 Do you think you might buy Legoland one day? Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. That would get lots of money. I think you've got more Lego than Legoland in your room right now. <laughs> yeah. It's all up in their room, is it? None in Legoland. Yes. Brilliant. It's good to catch up with you guys. Just give us a wave and say hi. Hi. And we hope to be back soon. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Bye. Hello, Beryl. Nice to see you. Yes. Hello, Tim. Hello uh, to everyone. I'm missing the fellowship of the church. Yes. And I've been keeping very busy. Good. Doing gardening and ringing some of the members of the church and friends and keeping in contact with everybody and also I've been doing quite a bit of praying I've got a prayer diary and I've added names to it every day and I'm praying for everyone it's fantastic that we, that we keep safe and keep healthy and do as they're told brilliant yeah. oh that's really good to hear and thank you Beryl um, anyone you want to say hi to yes I say hello to, to, to Jenny in hospital I've been praying for her, pray that everything goes well. And all those who are sick, all those who have lost loved ones in the church, I've been praying for them. And also, also, I've been read, I've been trying to read the Bible in a year, and I finish it during the lockdown. It's just over a year, but that is what I wanted. So lockdowns meant yeah. that you can lock, you've lock, finished lock, that one, yeah. Finished, yeah. That's brilliant. What a what a objective achieved. Well done. Fantastic. Beryl, thanks very much. Give us a wave. Thank you. Bye. Hope to see you all soon. Hello to all my friends at church. I miss you and I know Charlie does too. I hope we can all come back to church soon because I like the singing and learning with the other children and Anne-Marie, Tim and the other helpers. I hope everyone is well and staying safe. Please give our love and prayers to everyone. Me, Charlie, Dad, Hazel, miss you all very much. Morning all. We come together as the body of Christ to praise and worship the living God. Many of you are fed up with this isolation now and I have to say it's not my favourite thing. But through all this, the living God has not changed. He is here with us. He has a plan and a purpose, and our job is to be faithful and obedient. He knows everything about us and how we are feeling. Let's come before the living God and invite the Spirit to move among us and do a new thing. A moment of silence as we prepare ourselves.
great and wonderful God, we come before you in humility, in awe, in faith, in hope, in love, in worship. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We come to praise you, to bless you, to adore you, to acknowledge you, to thank you. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We come recognising your power, your authority, your wisdom, your faithfulness, your goodness, your love. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We come confessing our weakness, our unworthiness, our faults, our failings, our faithlessness, our lack of love. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We come seeking your mercy, your guidance, your strength, your renewal, your inspiration, your word. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We come to commit ourselves to your service, your purpose, your kingdom, your will, your people, your world. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Great and wonderful God, we come to you now in the name of Christ. Receive the worship we offer this day. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Question, said one of Jesus' friends. There's a man here who's been blind since he was born. Did that happen because his parents did something bad? No, Jesus said. God doesn't punish people by making their children blind. But I'll tell you what, God can use the man's blindness 
to show us how powerful he is. With that, Jesus walked over to the man. He knelt down. He spat on the ground. He made a horrible gooey paste out of mud and spit and he rubbed it on the man's eyes. Yuck! It was very messy. Now go and wash your face, Jesus said to the man, and you will be blind no more. The man washed his face and just as Jesus said, when he shook the water from his hair and his face, he opened his eyes and he could see. We have a question, said the people who had gathered around him. Aren't you the blind man who usually begs for food? I am, said the man who used to be blind. Then how can you see? I met a man named Jesus who rubbed mud in my eyes. The crowd were amazed and ready to cheer and someone spoke up. Excuse me, I have a question too. Now this someone was a religious teacher who didn't much like Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was so popular and didn't always agree with what the other teachers said. Jesus healed you. And he did it today, the teacher asked. That's right, said the man. Well, today is a day of rest. The special day God himself set aside. The day on which no one is allowed to work. Healing is most definitely work. So this Jesus can't be from God if he breaks God's law. I don't know, said the man, but I can see. Because a bad man made you well, accused the teacher. Hang on, said someone from the crowd. How can a bad man do such a good thing as healing this man? Yes, said another. How can a bad man do such a good thing? They asked the, the man who used to be blind all sorts of questions. Were you really blind? Were you pretending? Who is this Jesus man anyway? It was all too much for the man who used to be blind. Listen, he shouted. I don't know about all your questions, but I do know this. Once I was blind and now I can see. Who but someone sent by God could do such a thing? A little later, the man was sitting by himself. Jesus came to see him. I know it's been a hard day, said Jesus, but I have a question for you. Do you believe that God sent me? I do, said the man. I really do. Then no more questions, my child, Jesus said. Thank you.
is recognising that God is the Lord of time when my idea of timing doesn't agree with his. The assurance that God is perfecting his design for me when my life's course, once a swift flowing current, seems a stagnant pool. Confidence in God's faithfulness to me in an uncertain world on an uncharted course through an unknown future. And faith is reliance on the certainty that God has a pattern for my life when everything seems meaningless. Resting in the fact that God has an objective in leaving me on the scene when I feel useless to him and a burden to others. Expecting a sea of golden grain from the bleak, barren, endless fields, watered only by my tears, where I walk alone. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in prayer, asking you to be with the people of Lebanon as they set about clearing up after the devastating explosion which wiped out the docks and surrounding area. Be with the families of the deceased and heal those whom were injured in the blast. Allow the people to rebuild their community. Father, we ask you to give the scientists the knowledge needed to find the vaccine against coronavirus and maybe a cure. Please ensure there is enough to be made to go around the world. Wrap your comforting arms around the Bellworthy family and the Bryn family after their bereavements. Pour out your spirit upon them, Lord. Father, please give the doctors and the, the wisdom needed to get Alison the operation she needs to get her out of pain. Please heal all whom have had operations recently Heal them speedily so they can feel the benefit of the operation. We thank you, God, for the leadership team of the church, in particular, Alison and Tim. In your mercy, Lord, please hear this prayer. Amen. Let's pray. Living, loving Lord, your forgiveness is total. No notebook, tape recorder or post-it note to remind you of that moment when... You take our confession, offered with hands outstretched and gently, like the loving Heavenly Father that you are, put it to one side to be forgotten. No grudges, no itching for judgment, no resentment or ill will. Not like us who find it easy to say sorry, but so hard to forgive absolutely. Forgive us, Father, that we are often more willing to accept forgiveness than to forgive more willing to accept your love than to share it with those who have hurt us. Teach us to forgive as you forgive and help us, Lord, to lay all those things down that we know we cannot and should not do. Pour out your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.
wanted to share with you um, something I've been thinking about this summer. Um, last week I had a big go at my garden um, and I've got lots of um, pots on my patio um, and I've just got one that I wanted to show you. It's just here. Now I haven't got a clue what it is um, but I was given the bulbs um, about six or seven years ago when I went on a Girls Brigade Leaders Retreat. Um, we went to London and at the end of the day we were given I think three or four bulbs each and asked to go and plant them and see what happened. Um, and that's exactly what I did. I came back home, I did some playing around in soil, my technical word for gardening, um, and I planted them and I saw what happened. And my bulbs have had quite a journey. Um, a few years ago I had some foxes living under my patio and every morning I would open the curtains um, and see these bulbs being chucked around the garden um, and not ending up in the pot. So that was the first um, trauma. Second trauma is I'm not very well known for my gardening skills so my, my watering's a bit hit and miss. But this year my bulbs have actually produced flowers and I'm over the moon, I'm absolutely delighted. I haven't got a clue, as I said, I haven't got a clue what they are, but I am pleased. And that just reminded me that sometimes um, we don't quite know what we're doing um, and we can be a bit like those bulbs and we can be tossed around, we can be um, uprooted from our um, safe places and um, made to feel what on earth is going on and I'm sure my bulbs if they had feelings would have felt like that when the foxes were um, playing catch with them but over time and um, by God's grace good things do happen my bulbs have turned into amazing plants and this year they've actually had flower flowers on them so I just wanted to encourage you that if you feel a bit tossed around and a bit out of your comfort zone. God is with you and he can still do amazing things in all of our lives. Hello everyone. Just wanted to share a few thoughts about how I my experiences have been since my mum's um, passing. She died um, nearly three weeks ago. We had the funeral yesterday and um, my overriding 
um, feelings, emotions, whatever, have been a sense of peace and a sense of relief. Um, I'm sure that at different times the emotions will hit me and I will feel differently. And But overall, although my mum's faith wasn't perhaps as active as, as um, one might expect even, or, or it has been in the past, for me that assurance of knowing that she is with God is so, so crucial and so important at this time. Surely that's what our faith is all about. This moment of death, when really life begins, and this is how God intended it for us, to be in eternity with him. So I've had a sense of peace, a sense of calm, throughout the recent, you know, the weeks in, since my mum's passing. That may change over time, and I may experience different things, but for me that's what's been the main emotion. As we cleared my mum's flat last week, I went back in to just to do as a final check and I walked into the kitchen, leant onto the on the kitchen counter, looked out the window and just said, Goodbye, Mum. And then my immediate response was, But I'll see you soon, Mum. And that is what our Christian faith gives us. That gives us that sense of assurance, that sense of peace, that this is not the end. So I give thanks for my mum's life. I give thanks to all of you for your thoughts, your prayers, your words, your kind um, cards. And it's just so nice to know that the Christian family is, is so large and so supportive. And I give you thanks and God bless you. Amen. Hello, everyone. This week has been a week of mixed emotions for me. On Monday, sharing the excitement with Paul picking up the keys to his new home and sharing the sadness with Andy and Liz on Tuesday following Margaret's funeral. On Wednesday, sharing with the fun of a Zoom quiz with my dear friends. And then on Thursday, sharing some really excellent A-level results with one or two learners, and some lots of good learn results with another learner. But it made me think how very, very much I have in my life, and how many people I have in my life. I have friends to share these times with. I am really very blessed and today I can see that and thank God for it. But there are days when we feel alone. We might have friends or family around but sometimes there's an inner emptiness that that hurts. And my Bible reading today was Psalm 46 which ended like this. He says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted amongst the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now verse 7 and 11 are the same. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. A fortress. That's a building designed to keep us safe. To make us feel protected and secure. And I hope that this week God helps you feel safe, secure and cared for. Have a good week. Faith is claiming God's strength to accept and endure weariness, pain, decline, patiently, depending on the fact that God is love, not an ability to figure out why. Smashed hopes, reversal, tragedy. Confidence that God is acting for my highest good when he answers no to my prayers. Thanking God when I am left with shattered plans, that he has better plans. And rejoicing in the eternal glory accumulating from my temporary troubles when my usefulness or health or loved one is gone and I feel not needed. Refuse to worry when I haven't a clue as to what God would have me do with my life.
Dear Lord Jesus, we bring our prayers to you today as we continue to live in these very unusual times. We pray for our world and especially Beirut after the terrible chemical explosion claiming many lives. And we pray for all countries still coping with COVID-19. We remember all those involved in the train crash in Aberdeenshire for the families grieving their loved ones. We pray for our local community that they continue to work together and look after each other. We continue to remember Andy Bellworthy and Pat and Jaggy and families as they mourn the passing of their mothers. We pray for all those grieving loved ones, for those in ill health and those with long-term illnesses. We rejoice with Paul Coote as he looks forward to moving into his new home. We thank God for answered prayer. May God continue to work in all our lives. Amen. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he does for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us, nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve, for his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers we are only dust. Our Father, eternally heaven, hallowed be our name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done with earth and heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we give those who trespass against us. And lead us from the temptation, but lead us from evil. Divide the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Last week, the Bible passage was actually about a blind man who Jesus healed by mixing a paste of mud and spittle and putting it on the man's eyes. When he washed it off, he could see. And I'm not sure in this day and age anyone would be terribly pleased about that. But a man born blind had his physical sight restored by Jesus. And this leads to a discussion with the Pharisees again about who Jesus is and whether he can be who he says he is because he has healed this man on the Sabbath which was against Jewish law, and of course, in the Pharisees' eyes, the Messiah would certainly not break Jewish law because it was sacred. There's a bit of argy-bargy. They question the man who was healed about who did it. They question the healed man's parents about whether he really was born blind. They then speak to the once blind man again and declare Jesus a sinner because he has acted on the Sabbath. And the man has the courage to stick up for Jesus, saying, no one but God could do such a thing. This obviously upsets the Pharisees and challenges them. And as a result, they throw him out of the synagogue. And that leads to today's passage. Over to you, Carol. When Jesus heard what had happened, he found the man and asked, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The man answered, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. You have seen him, Jesus said, and he is speaking to you. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshipped Jesus. Then Jesus told him, 
I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. Some Pharisees who were standing nearby heard him and asked, Are you saying we are blind? If you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, Jesus replied, but you remain guilty because you claim you can see. Thanks. Now, bear with me, all will become clear. I haven't gone mad, but there are certain living phenomena that can be seen almost anywhere in the world. They're called lichens, and they are found on rocks, tree trunks, and a variety of other places where they cling and grow. There are many varieties, different shapes and colours, and this isn't meant to be a biology lesson, but there is something about lichens and their use that relates to our passage today. From the 16th century to the present day, lichens have been used in scientific experiments to test the pH levels in liquids. Don't ask me what that stands for, I can't remember. Now the test is called a litmus test. A blue dye and a pink dye are extracted from certain lichens. A particular variety of paper, litmus paper, is infused with the pink or blue dye. The paper now has the ability to change colour under certain conditions, demonstrating whether the solution into which it was dipped was acidic, alkaline or neutral. And over a period of time, the litmus test began to take on a new meaning. People started using that term to make a judgment about whether or not someone or something was acceptable. The litmus test came to mean the single most important and deciding factor that provided the right answer or led to the right decision. And that's where we are as we come to today's passage. Jesus is about to give a litmus test that will clearly define the difference between spiritual blindness and spiritual sight. What is it that you need to do in order to receive spiritual sight? The passage Carol read for us begins, Jesus heard what had happened. He found the man and asked, do you believe in the son of man? When Jesus learned that the man he had healed of his blindness has been thrown out of the temple, publicly interrogated and removed, and that people everywhere in the city were talking about this and the Pharisees' reaction, Jesus went looking for him. And he kept searching until he found him. The blind man didn't ask Jesus for this miracle. And I'm sure he wasn't expecting Jesus to search him out. Now comes the litmus test. Jesus asked the man, do you believe in the son of man? And he's asking him to make a choice, a commitment. There's no doubt that this man recognised the voice of Jesus. How could he forget the voice of the one who put mud on his eyes and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam? The critical phrase in this conversation is son of man. When Jesus used this title, the healed man knew who Jesus was talking about. He knew he was referring to the Messiah because in the book of Daniel, Daniel himself was having dreams and visions from God and this is what he had to say. As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into the presence. He was given authority, honour and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. As the man looked at Jesus, he would have known this passage which is a description of the coming Messiah that every Jew would have recognised. Jesus often used it to refer to himself, which is what irritated the Pharisees. But here, the ex-blind man knew exactly who Jesus was referring to. He was referring to the Messiah, the Son of God. And he responds by saying, Who is he, sir? I want to believe in him. He wants to believe. And he's ready to believe, but he's not sure yet who Jesus is referring to. Now, just as an aside, the word sir in this tra translation may say in yours, Lord. But the right translation, according to scholars, is sir. And that does make sense because he doesn't know who Jesus is at the point in the story. 
Jesus continues, you have seen him and he is speaking to you. And the man's response is immediate and appropriate. Yes, Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshipped Jesus. So at that point, the blind man passed the test. His spiritual eyes were opened as well as his physical eyes, and he immediately acknowledged that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the Son of Man, by believing in him and worshipping him. This time, when he calls Jesus Lord, he's addressing him as the Messiah, his Messiah, the King of Kings and Lords of Lords. As he said those words, he fell at Jesus' feet and Jesus accepted his worship. Jesus did not forbid people to worship him while he was on this earth. Worship was a public thing in New Testament times. It wasn't reserved for inside church. It was something that people did in public to demonstrate their loyalties. President uh, Franklin Roosevelt was a regular churchgoer. There is a story that on one gloomy Sunday morning during World War II, he walked three miles to go to church. One of his neighbours noticed this and said to him, I can worship in the fields or anywhere else. Yes, replied Mr Roosevelt, but no one will ever suspect you of it. This man, who Jesus healed, wasn't concerned about other, what others thought of him or said about him. Without hesitation, he fell to his knees in the presence of all of them and worshipped his Lord. What a contrast to the scribes and Pharisees. When Jesus revealed to them who he was, they picked up stones to stone him. Their idea about who the Messiah was and what he would be like had blinded them to the truth before them. While this man is on the ground at Jesus' feet, Jesus turns to those standing around him and says, I entered this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind, and to show those who think they see that they are blind. And I think the word judgment is not used here in the sense of condemnation. Jesus came for judgment in the sense that he was the dividing line. He was the one who would separate one group from the other. He was the litmus test, defining and separating spiritual light from spiritual darkness. Those who admitted their spiritual blindness would be given spiritual insight from Jesus. And those who were convinced that they already had spiritual understanding would continue in their spiritual blindness, pronouncing judgment upon themselves. When we acknowledge we need Jesus, we step from the blindness into the light. Someone has said there is no one so blind as he who refuses to see. Anyone been to the fridge and said to whoever is in the house, where's, where's whatever? And they come and look in and put their hand straight on it. And they do that huffy, you are ridiculous tone and body language. What the Pharisees need is under their nose. Jesus is pointing towards it and they still refuse to see. Now, some of the Pharisees who were close enough to hear this conversation decided to ask him a question. And they phrase their question in such a way as to let Jesus know what they are expecting him to say to them. Are you saying we're blind? They were expecting Jesus to give them the answer, no. After all, they were very religious people. No one would dare to accuse them of errors concerning spiritual matters. Except Jesus, that is. And I think they are trying to twist his arm, so to speak, to make Jesus say something that he really doesn't want to say. These Pharisees are living in a state of denial. They are spiritually blind. They have chosen to forget all the other times when Jesus made them face the fact about their sinful actions and exposed them to the truth of God's word. This isn't the first time he has had this conversation after all, live it. They've had plenty of opportunity to really think and see from themselves. They preferred to close their eyes and pretend that it didn't happen. And I think many people in today's world are just as blind for whatever reason. The Pharisees are waiting for Jesus to exonerate them, to tell them how good they are so that the discussion can be closed, covered up 
and not mentioned again. However, the response they receive from Jesus is not what they expect or want to hear. He says, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty, but you remain guilty because you claim you can see. What does he mean by that? Jesus is saying that if the Pharisees would admit to their ignorance of the truth and were willing to confess that ignorance and turn to him, listen to him and recognize him as the Messiah, the son of God, the son of man as described in Daniel, they would be forgiven and set free from their sin. People are not condemned for what they cannot do or cannot understand. However, if these Pharisees are so proud and so confident in their own wisdom, so sure that they are right, that they shut their eyes to the truth, the truth that is under their nose, their sin will remain unforgiven and they will be to blame. In a spiritual sense, there is a big difference between the one who is blind and knows it and can choose to do something about it and the one who simply shuts his eyes. Only the person who realises his own blindness can learn to see. Only the one who realises his own sin can be forgiven. It's a choice that each of us has to make. The Pharisees were presented with the truth. They rejected it and therefore they were blind. Our choice is the same. Is Jesus the Messiah? Yes or no? Now, there are times when an illustration doesn't quite go all the way in explaining the circumstances that fit the topic of conversation or the passage of scripture that is being studied. And in this case, there is a sense in which the litmus test doesn't fit the topic of spiritual sight and doesn't completely align with the words of Jesus, where he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? A litmus test shows one of three results after being dipped into liquid alkaline, acidic, or neutral. When it comes to belief in Jesus Christ, there is no neutral ground. You are either making a decision for Jesus or you're making a decision against him. Evangelist Billy Graham said, if you make no decision for Christ, you're making a decision against Christ. There's no sitting on the fence. And God doesn't honor good intentions which side of the fence are you on at the moment? If you're unsure, wouldn't this be a good time to make sure? How you respond to Jesus is the greatest decision in your life. It will determine the quality of your life on this earth as well as your eternal destiny. The Bible says that there are only two eternal destinations and each of us is going to one or the other. Please make the right decision and see what a difference it makes to be a true child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Yes or no? Blind or not? Choice is yours. And I'm happy to answer questions and to go on a journey with you. Do you believe in the Son of Man? A moment to reflect. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace.